And I have with me here Michael McDonald, so it's going to be a great session. I was just telling Michael that I have had a pretty unsettled mind lately. I, My mother-in-law passed away pretty recently, and I felt like I did a session before a couple weeks ago, and I was just like, put on this happy face, and... And was like, oh, I'm good, and and <laughs> and I want to be a little bit more real today during this session, and and just kind of honest and and share that with you guys as well. At the start of this, we're going to be exploring a really fun topic, which is going beyond your psychology. So how to flow with life. And I started this because I've had before an unsettled mind. <laughs> I was looking for something to improve it, to make it better, to just kind of be the fix. And I don't think it works that way. <laughs> and I've learned that. And there is a way that we can use your minds in a different way that helps you flow a little bit more with life, even if you're not feeling the best. So we're going to be exploring that. And my guest, Michael, he helps entrepreneurs, executives, and leaders live their lives with more wisdom and less stress. He focuses on relational alchemy to transform lives. Welcome, Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Rich. I'm really glad to be back in conversation with you and the folks here get to muse, explore, share a bit about this idea of beyond psychology. Uh, do you want me to jump in with like why this topic sort of popped up for me? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's like, like the two words together beyond psychology. It's something I've heard talked about before. It's, words that Michael Neal uses a lot. It's around a lot in the three principles community that we have in common and something sunk into a, a deeper degree over the last couple months. I had an insight. Like, it's like, it's like, Oh, ooh, ooh. I, cause I recently read the power of systems by Steve Chandler and Trevor Timbeck. Excellent book. Amazing. Using the metaphor of systems for everything. And one of the things I loved about it is the original title was supposed to be uh, Systems Not Psychology. The value of what are you doing? What's your system? Not just like artificial systems, not just um, lo purely logistical, but even the system of listening for wisdom, the system of allowing your mind to settle down, the system of allowing yourself to feel those are all systems too, but psychology being the territory where we start getting caught up, where we get in the way of magical things that are trying to happen, where we get in the way of healing, we get in the way of something that like we get in the way of what we really want. It's really just where we most get blocked tends to be in this territory of psychology and at the same time, we are surrounded by this world of like with lots of roots in therapy and transformational world where we're assumed that we should think about things more and that we should dig in and think harder and analyze and go back into the past and relive everything. And it like, I just see that creates so much pain and looping and drama and making things harder. And it's this huge misconception that I see throughout the whole transformational world. And so from this aha run systems, like, Ooh, okay. This, like, it's not just three principles, like stepping on and realizing that all of the kinds of methodologies, all the approaches that I've been involved in throughout my life and all the ones that I'm most drawn towards. And it seems like the ones that are most effective and easiest and have the biggest impact. There's also some, also all of them have some variation of not getting caught up in your thinking, <laughs> not 
making it mean something about you. Um, sometimes it's focused on like, okay, you're assuming that you're doing that, then you sort of do things to get out of it. But um, it's something I noticed in energy healing. It's something that I noticed, uh, like really the core of IFS is capital S self, who you really are. Um, what I've heard is successful within uh, like depression therapy. It's central to habit change. It's central to like constructive living. It's central to power of systems. It's central to process work. Uh, all these methodologies, which tend to be my favorites, are all variations of like, yeah, like think about it less or like don't think about it. Or yeah, you have thoughts, but that's secondary, if not tertiary or, or less. So what I mean by beyond psychology, it's not that you shouldn't have a psychology. It's not that you shouldn't think it, that you shouldn't have an ego. You shouldn't have anything going on in your brain. It's more transcending and including psychology. It's demoting how much you think about yourself to a secondary, less important thing to do. There was a study, I think I heard this from Dr. Bill Pettit, where there's a study of people who went through uh, CBT therapy, a cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. And they're studying how likely it was and what were the causal factors for people relapsing back into depression. So like they did CPT, they got better. Did they spring back? Did they fall back or go back into depression? And there's a, an assumption as probably most people in our worlds would assume that it was, would be how much positive thinking or negative thinking would be the factor for whether they went back into depression and as a surprise, and I love scientific studies where they're like surprised, I especially love scientific studies where they're surprised and I'm not surprised. <laughs> so to their surprise, what the difference was had nothing to do with how much positive or negative thinking these people had that had nothing to do with whether they went back into depression or they just stayed fine, healthy, mentally healthy. The difference was whether they decentered from their thinking or not. The people, independent of whether it's positive or negative thinking, when they weren't as identified with that thinking, they were fine. They didn't go back into depression. Like they just, they're mentally healthier, they're good. The people, even the ones who had lots of positive thinking, but if they're identified with it, if they're like, if they were their thinking, if they were their psychology, those are the people who relapsed. Those are the people who went back into depression. There's so much focus on this assumption that we should be thinking better. And it's not even quite like the healthy alternative. It's sometimes tempting to say thinking less. I think it's more accurate to say, not believing our thinking so much, not identifying with it's like, we have thinking, we have all the drama, we have the beliefs, we have memories that come up, feelings flow and allowing that to be part of just being human. But then when we loop on that, when we take our experience and we start analyzing it, we start thinking about it, we start trying to fix it, we start trying to understand it, that's when we drift away. And that's when we get stuck. I see all these methodologies around me where they create a lot of value, but they don't understand this part of like when we think something, it starts to become more real. They sort of miss that bit and they end up having people sort of in an oscillation going back and forth. Like, okay, you're kind of better doing this, but now you've also turned it into this thing. It's like, oh, I now, I am now these letters, or I now have this kind of process, or I'm this kind of personality. 
and then they have more and more and more work to do. And it's sort of like the never ending to do list. <laughs> and people just get like more dramatic and kind of like more fragile and less resourced as they go into this. So yeah, that's a, a bit of what I'm pointing towards for beyond psychology. <laughs> And and I went down that path. Like I was thinking, okay, give me all the techniques, give me all the, the things to do. I'm gonna experiment with them all. And that's fine. But if you're doing it believing your own story, if you're doing it believing, okay, well this is working kind of and it's not working, and you're creating all of this energy around it it's just not going to to lead you in the right direction towards your wholeness towards flow you can use any technique to bring you out of flow <laughs> you can use any technique to bring you into flow and it depends on how much you're identifying with the power of your own thinking Yeah, like all these methodologies would totally make sense and would be very important. I'd be shouting from the rooftops how important it is to like do them or pick one that works for you and do it a lot. Mm -hmm. It would all make sense if we didn't have wisdom. It all ma would make sense if there, if there wasn't something that was beyond psychology, if there wasn't something that was better than psychology. But it turns out when we're not really in it and there's it's a different kind of conversation talking to someone who is in the midst of it because it's a bit more navigating but when you're ready for some perspective seeing that having a settled mind as we are talking about here there's something better than your psychology there's something better than whatever your diagnosis of the day is and we do really well in that space. We know what to do. And I observed this in, so as an energy healer for about six years, and I observed this within the energy healing work. When people settle down and really got present, sometimes in addition to having a lot going on, like they might be in deep emotional process, they might be shaking and moving tons out of energy, but accessing this deeper aspect, something that's not psychological, when they accessed that, that's where the healing came from. The healing didn't come from anything that we did talking about why or where or where, like what this process was happening. It's what didn't come from analyzing and it did not come from understanding at all what was going on. It came from them getting present. Like, and it's usually that mix of, Oh, my psychology is totally freaking out right now. And a deeper aspect of them realizing that, and I'm totally okay. I'm just person in room, maybe screaming and shaking, and I'm totally okay. Like, that's the healing moment. Another insight I've been playing with recently is, because like leaning in this direction, I had an aha of, what if I don't need to understand anything? Like, if we really have wisdom, then... Nothing needs to make sense. Like things making sense is actually secondary rather than something that we have to do. It might occur to us to ask questions, do the math, put some things together, think about it. But most of the world doesn't make sense at all. And thinking that it should is just driving us crazy. 
thinking that everything makes sense is actually driving us into all of this like separation and like moving us away from mental health. <laughs> yeah, we're we're trying to understand everything and if we we understand it with our psychology how valuable is that actually? Right? Does it, it might give us a sense of, aha, I'm, I'm very clever and very smart. I recently posted this, this post that said, I'd rather be happy than clever. Yeah. And, and that's her nature is to be happy. Mm. And I think most of us think her nature is supposed to be clever. Yeah. Or that, or that we have to for some reason. And, yeah. and it's a, a requirement because if we're not clever, we're not good enough. It's, it's of course, coming from a fear. Alex uh, asked a question as well. As he said, I'm curious how Michael distinguishes what changes and what he does and when he's in it versus outside mm -hmm. of it and can focus on wisdom. So it sounds like even though wisdom is the best, it's not what he or sometimes we focus on all of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's sort of different answers depending on whether it's with myself or working with someone else, though there's shared ground there. A lot of it, honestly, is when I'm caught up, I'm caught up. And the difference is I know even more that I'm caught up. Like imagine the difference between being drunk and not knowing you're drunk or being drunk and being very aware that you're drunk. Like that's one of the benefits of understanding this more deeply. It doesn't mean that we're not in it, that we don't get into the psychology and reactionary and messy and but understanding this tends to create more space i'm not as identified with it uh like over the last couple of years i have hours days sometimes multiple days i don't think it goes as long as a week anymore but where i'm caught up i'm like resentful or i'm lonely or in some sort of just like icky process and it's messy or it's just, it drags me down, but I know that I'm in it. So I tend to, like, I, I notice that I, I don't really make decisions as much from that territory. I don't believe my thinking so much, even though I can't seem to get out of it as quickly as I would like to. So that's one thing. That's when I'm in it. I feel like I've gotten more sane over time, the more that I've understood this. Now, when other people are in this, and if I'm in touch with wisdom and I'm with, with some, I'm with someone who totally is not in touch with wisdom, it's actually a really beautiful dance. Uh, I've done that a lot. Like I've, I'm often the person at the festival or like in camp or whatever, we're at the party where if someone is really freaking out, perhaps on psychedelics or something, I'm the person that they go get. Uh, not because I'm even specifically trained as a guide or anything, but I'm great with people who are really deep in it and freaking out and they don't know who they are and they've lost reality because I know that they're totally okay. I, when someone's really in this, it, it's not the kind of conversation like we're having here where we're talking like high up, like sort of here's what's really going on. It's me knowing like my wisdom gets to hold the space. I know that no matter what is going on for a person, anyone, everyone underneath that, they're fundamentally okay. And that whatever is going on with them, there's an intelligence to what's happening. So I just sit in awe and love with someone who is really caught up. 
and it always works out beautifully. Like it's kind of fun sitting with people who are in extreme states. <laughs> I get to learn even more. I get even like closer because if I try to be clever or if I try to use any of my methodologies, it probably will not go well. This so reminds me of, I recently wrote a, a post or a, a, an article and I talk about how it's kind of like when you're going to the movie. And we, we use the uh, movies as a metaphor quite a bit, but I like to talk about it as like you, in order to enjoy a movie, you have to have something called a suspension of disbelief. And so you have to, you know that, you know, superheroes can't fly, you know that World War II is over, but you, you set that aside, that knowing aside, in order to enjoy the movie, but you don't set all of it aside. You, you watch the movie from a grounded place of, I'm okay, I'm sitting in a comfortable seat, I've got popcorn that I'm shoving in my face. I am in an air-conditioned theater. I am okay. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have that grounded knowing, then we would freak out. And we, especially if the movie gets scary, if, if the killer's coming at the, the screen with a bloody knife, we'd scream and run out of the theater. But we don't. We, we stay in our seats, even though we feel it. We feel it. <laughs> we still stay in our seats. And it sounds like when you have that in yourself, you you come from this grounded place of, oh, I'm I'm still in my seat. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you even forget that, and that's okay too. And that's temporary. And then when other people are in that place, they're watching that scary movie, and you just kind of go sit next to them. And you talk to them a little bit and kind mm -hmm. of say, hey, looks like you're sitting in your seat. Looks like you're safe. I know you're safe. I'm going to talk to you like you're safe in this comfortable theater. And I just know you're watching a scary movie. And that eventually the movie is going to end. And then we can walk out of the theater together. Yeah. Like recently, one of my favorite coaching tactics after having a, a long coaching call with all sorts of ups and downs and explorations and ahas, and they've gone on like this emotional journey, uh, I'll, I'll point out at the end, it's like, and by the way, the only thing that has happened this entire call is man in room or woman in room talking to screen. <laughs> Everything that you just experienced was inside. Mm. When you went somewhere and it was troubling or there's this person you're t talking about or like the situation or circumstance, like, yeah, everything that you just experienced was actually inside of you. Mm. Okay. That's sometimes what I refer to as the ascendant work, like, like, going up to having high altitude perspective. Like, okay, yeah, good reminder. All of that was just here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's happening and it is so real and vivid and it activates the body to make it real. It even comes in and like it, it we act from what looks real to us. We train the people around us to like to play along with what we think is real so yeah we end up creating from this internal world that we've made up <laughs> and it's really really helpful to remember that we're making it up it doesn't mean that you should stop having experience because that's just not a human that's just nothing <laughs> <laughs> Not the good, rich nothing, but that's just like, yeah, that's just no human experience. That's just, that's no consciousness at all.
Yeah, I think my other like intervention, which the more I've seen this, and also like the more that I've worked, the more I've, the person I'm working with has seen this. Um, the the Bob Newhart skit, stop it. <laughs> it's like a a spiritual teaching that just keeps on becoming deeper as I revisit it over the years. I think even I went to Byron Katie's school and she showed that video amongst a bunch of other videos. I think one of the last days. Um, it, at first it looks sort of like bypassy or too simple or just really funny, kind of insensitive. But the more that you see how made up everything is, and when you're coming from that, it becomes really powerful. Like a, a client I worked with who was suicidal just before they began working with me, um, the the first insight that they had was basically, oh yeah, it doesn't matter. Like realizing they're making up all this stuff and this and this and drama and drama and drama. It's like, oh yeah, you don't need to think any of that. Like that's just unhelpful thinking. The, Remind me of what the skit is for those people who are listening that they might not have seen the skit and I'm sure that they can go on the internet and look it up, but remind us what that skit is. Yeah. So I highly recommend looking it up on YouTube. It's hilarious. Um, I think it's from mad TV. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I have no idea like what year. So it's, it's an old <laughs> skit. Um, it's so a woman comes in and like Bob Newhart is the therapist. And so she is, af she's afraid of being buried alive in a box. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so he has an unconventional therapeutic method where, okay, he's charged by the minutes, like just a dollar per minute, max five minutes. Doesn't usually take anything any longer than that. And so she explains her situation. She, ex she explains her problem. And he sets it up as, okay, well, so I'm going to tell you two words and I guarantee that this is going to solve your problem forever, as long as you can follow this advice. And it's like, you don't need to write it down. It's pretty easy to remember. Stop it. <laughs> and she's like, but you mean just but stop it? Yes. Stop it. Just, should I just like stop doing this or stop thinking about this? Like, yeah, stop it. You, like this, it's not working for you. It's painful. Just stop, like stop thinking about being buried alive in a box. It sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the part where she's like, she's like, oh, well, back in my childhood. And he's, he's like, no, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like, but, but my, yeah, my childhood, but my parents, no, we don't do that. Yep, like, but no. my horoscope, no, no, nope, we definitely, we definitely don't, do, don't do that. Don't go there. <laughs> but I have this trauma. It's like, no, none of that. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it's, it's like the, the, it's like a horror skit for most traditional psychotherapy because anything but this, like you need to talk about it. Like you need to go everywhere. You need to go in. you need to feel it. You need to talk, ex you need to understand it to release it. Mm. Um, you don't need to pick something up in order to put it down. If you realize that it's not you and it's not helpful and it's painful and like the feeling of it lets you know that you don't need to go there, that it's not helpful to go there even, then don't go there. Like I've got, uh, two friends or actually like, uh, like two sisters and they had like some sort of massive conflict between them. There is some sort of conflict breaking point. Um, but one of them like has this understanding. Um, actually I think, yeah, both now both of them do. And they got back together and just like, basically decided to love each other and they quite intentionally do not talk about what the conflict was or what happened or analyzing it. Like the best clearing conversation coming from this understanding is no clearing conversation. 
because you don't need to talk about something that isn't even real, isn't even present. It might be even hard to remember what was going on. Like, why would you want to create a dramatic story in order to like, like you don't need to create drama to get over drama. You can, you can just get <laughs> over it. You can just be present with another beautiful human being and create from there. When you realize that psychology isn't true, it's, it's real when you think it. It's real when you give conscious to it, consciousness to it. But it's not true. And it's not a thing. It's not a thing that you need to fix or do anything about. It actually dissolves on its own. It actually reorganizes itself on its own when you're not bringing it up and when you're not trying to do something about it. And I think that's one of the biggest misunderstandings, even back from Freud days. Like I heard one version of like where Freud came up with, you must go back into the past. Um, I think this is from uh, David Reynolds that I heard this. So at least like, that's my reference here. I heard that Freud, he noticed when he was working with someone with hysteria, like the like original, like parts of the body and the brain are not communicating properly. Like things are moving that they don't want to move or can't move, but they want to move. Um, one of his clients just started sharing about their past and then they were better. Freud sort of used a, like a correlation as causation. It's like, oh, get people to talk about their past in order for them to heal. And it, it works to a degree for like that small branch of hysteria. Like that's actually a good methodology for a tiny branch of things that happen for people. But he just started applying it everywhere. And that if then it sort of built up that a therapeutic thing of if it's not working, you just need to do it for longer. Or if it's not working, you just need to really dig in and experience it even more. How I see that now, based on this description of Freud, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but based on this description, yeah, that person who was sharing their memories, and I've noticed this in energy healing as well, if they're shaking, if they're sharing memories, like whatever happens, it's happening from wisdom, where wisdom is actually primary. Coming from wisdom, you might remember things. Coming from wisdom, traumatic memories might come up and you might have a bit of an episode. But it's actually stuff that's on its way out. It's actually part of the healing when you start trying to do this stuff intentionally, when you start thinking that you should do this, like you should go back and remember, you should feel an experience, you should shake, or you should do this, or you should do that. It's you're trying to take over wisdom's role of knowing what to do. And that tends to either block or get in the way or make things more dramatic. Or you, or at best, it means that you don't fully heal. You like you heal a bit, but instead of it resolving, you're kind of stuck in a methodology. You're stuck in, it's like having something, and you need to keep on doing it, and it's going to take a lot of work. Okay, there's things happening in the chat, so I'm curious I what's, I was, <laughs> <laughs> what they're saying. Uh, what it. Leah said, loving the idea of not believing my thinking. It's just one construct, one perspective. It's not the only way. And I, I feel like that's so true that we're kind of wearing a helmet of thinking. And we, the thing is, like you were pointing to, we don't have to take off the helmet. And in fact, we can't. We can't stop it. We, you can't control your thoughts, but you can not believe it. You can dismiss them. You can deprive them of energy. Yeah, and this is a missing piece. Um, it's kind of a missing link between like therapy and spiritual understanding. There's thought, and 
like a, a couple of ways to word this. Like one is I, I like decentering from my thinking mm. is one that I've been using recently. Like it's there, but like my center is something else. Mm. Uh, it's detaching. It's, it's having, it's being with, it's loving your thinking. It's relating with your thinking. It's that you are not your thinking. You have thinking. You're the space in which thinking happens. Like it's territory that like lots of non-dual meditation um, takes a lot of work and esoteric thinking about in order to get this realization. But just knowing that there is, um, there's sort of like a slider here. There's a spectrum of like, is this thought an alien face hugger where this is just true and real the way the world is, the way that I am, and this is, this is important. Or is it like, oh yeah. I'm kind of freaking out right now, aren't I? <laughs> like there's, there's a range that is hard. It's a little hard to talk about, but it's really important to notice that there's a range. And the more that you notice the difference, the more choice there seems to be for how real your thoughts become. I'm going to open it up to for other people to speak if they would like. I know that Alex had a question. Alex, would you like to ask that in person? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to ask it. Um, yeah, Michael, I was saying I, I love the analogy of states like um, depression to drunkenness and knowing that you're drunk or not knowing that you're drunk. Um, but it, it seems like that does sort of in some ways regress the problem one step like what if you just end up drunk a lot and you want to be less drunk like you can maybe accept that you're drunk but actually i would really prefer to be drunk less often it seems like you still want to do <laughs> something about it like what what's there so yeah i mentioned ascendant and this is sort of an ascendant conversation it sounds kind of like a really fancy too fancy word but like like elevated like like high elevation there's also and this is kind of a methodology. Yeah. When you're in it, th that's where a combination of when I'm working with someone who's in it, me knowing that it's made up makes it a lot easier and more helpful for me to use methodologies, knowing that I'm making it up. Like when I knew that energy healing was just I'm like where I don't know how much of it was actually energy and how much of it was theater, but it seems to help. It gave me total permission to totally go for it. And it ended up being much more powerful. So going with the experience. It's also just advice for when you're really caught up. It's the trying to like thinking that it's not okay adding thinking, adding judgment to what's already going on tends to be what keeps it really stuck and really looping. Like I'm really sad and that's not okay. I'm really sad. And what do I do? Or how do I figure out how to get out of this? It's, it's kind of like a stop adding that next layer. And also like, it's okay to have any experience. It's okay to have any feeling. It's okay to be making any thought real. So that even when you forget that you're making it up, even when it's really terrible, like it's permission to lean into the experience. Going into the raw, in the moment, full-bodied, emotional, energetic experience of the moment is another way of not being, not thinking about it. Like shamanic work, medicine work, uh, feeling your feelings, like all these methodologies really work because they're also versions of not going into self-concept. So if you're feeling something, lean into it. And some of the ways I also like to play there is 
let yourself really enjoy it. Like if you're really angry, let yourself enjoy being really angry. You can do it playfully. You can use ex existential kink where you like, you secretly really enjoy this. Or you could become like a, a little kid, just like, ah, I don't like this. Stop it. I, the world just is wrong. Please stop it. <laughs> so those are also like, uh, these are all approaches where you're not going into your thinking. And it can include having no idea what's going on, but not fighting what's going on. So hopefully that helps. Can I, do you mind if I share a quick story about it too, Michael? Please. George Pransky has this story that I, I just loved. I heard so much in where he was camping with this, this friend and this friend was like, oh man, we got to go get firewood. And he was rushing over to the firewood place and gathering it really quickly. And he's like, oh man, we got to go back and, and we got to get dinner ready. And, and he's like starting to, he's like taking out all the stuff to cook. And then his wife is like, why are you freaking out? And, and he's like, well, we need to get ready. And she's like, you're wearing your sunglasses. And he didn't <laughs> realize, he thought it was getting dark. So he didn't realize that it was that dark. And he's like, oh, oh, I'm wearing my sunglasses. And so that's what happens when we're in our own thoughts. We don't realize we're wearing our sunglasses. And when you realize it, you can, you can adjust. You can, you can take that into account as you act in the world. And that's one of the best things to do. And then also, when, if you really realize it, you'll take them off. Like if you see it from a very deep level of, oh man, I'm, I've been wearing the sunglasses the whole time. It, you don't have to do a technique to take them off. You'll just, it'll make sense to. Mm -hmm. What other questions do we have? Um, hi, this is Leah. Hi, Michael. Hi, Leah. Good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. It's so warming your voice is so gentle and warming <laughs> and rich i'm enjoying you very much too i just had to comment because i went through something just this weekend that had to do with what we were just talking about there was i went to a wonderful afternoon workshop at the end of it was told about a party of a going away of a friend that i had not been invited to she and i were friends but you know i would be crashing this if i went to this party she hadn't invited me right but all of my other friends were going to be there I said to myself, what's the worst thing that could happen? It, it, I'd been through a hard open workshop and I knew that all these thoughts were going to come up once, once I got there, it was going to be a total trigger fest, you know, if I went <laughs> and mm -hmm. Michael knows me pretty well. I'm like a very outgoing creature. I love events and parties and conscious in our conscious community. So I did go. It was really fascinating to watch things come up as they happened and to put that into a kind of a role as if I was in a green room as an actor watching the whole play. And by the end of it, my friend was very happy that I was there to experience it. But I did invade a boundary. I watched what happened. It was just fascinating. And now she's so grateful because I took all the photos because I love doing photos as a PR person, conscious PR. Mm -hmm. And so... She loves them. She's so happy I took them and so on. But I'm just going to leave it there. It, I'm not going to say I'm going to do this every day, but it was really good to come up. You know, my triggers, I knew were going to come right up and to kind of deal with them and set them all aside to have an, a really great experience. So what do you think of that? <laughs> yeah, well, it, I'm, there's a, a lot that comes to mind, but I'm curious if there's a, a question like a specific question about that. <laughs> Not really. Just kind of wanted to um, offer that as an experience that just happened. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like two perspectives. One is it's interesting that you went and amongst all the thinking. Right. Like, I think there's like, to me, that points towards wisdom. There's a, like a knowing to go anyways. Yeah. That despite was what all was the stuff going on. That's right. It was like I was being led by wisdom to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bigger picture than me. Yeah. I also hear a lot of 
practicing what you're going to think. Like right. thinking I'm going to think this and this and this. So I'm not at all surprised that you do. Uh, <laughs> and I'm really glad that you're following wisdom anyways. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It means a you're lot, welcome. actually. <laughs> Good to see you. Oh, you too. Thanks for having me on here. Anything else? <laughs> yeah, Alex's comment, practicing thinking what I'm thinking is real. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had conversations in my head before. Yeah. Like, how many of you have had arguments with people in your head, planning what you're going to say? What if this happens? What What are you going to say to them? What are you going to think? Like, how much... Can you catch yourself thinking about what you're going to think or thinking about what you thought about in the past, thinking about what you're going to think about when you think that again? And what if none of that was helpful or necessary? Like in, instead, I, I've found when I stop doing that, Instead of becoming a blithering idiot or completely lazy or evil or something, it turns out I'm just present. I know what to do. I'm creative. And if there's something to remember at some point, it comes to mind. And none of that was actually necessary it just creates a lot of stress and tension and is like trying to fill a bunch of space that doesn't need to be filled. There is so much less to think about. There's so many things we do not need to think about. And it's awesome and ridiculous. Every time I drop another level of that, because I keep on dropping levels of that over the years. <laughs> It's so funny, too, because I think that we, we have no idea what we're going to feel in that situation or what we're going to think in that situation. We're trying to predict. And in a way, that prediction s kind of creates the reality once we get into that situation, even though it tends to go different anyway. Yeah, it's self-reinforcing. Mm -hmm. Like the more that we give that whatever, like that consciousness, that belief, that attention, that identification with our thinking, with our psychology, our beliefs, what, what, what kind of personality pattern we think we are, the more that we pay attention, both the more we become it, the more we feel it, like it activates the, our nervous system will match what the story that we're believing we'll behave that way. We'll do like, that's how we will be in the world. That's how we will be with other people. They will see us that way. The mirror, the, the world will mirror who we're being. And I think there's this first layer of recognizing that this is made up, recognize that this is what's going on because we're not conscious for most of us. We're not consciously choosing which thoughts to give life to. We think that because it's big, we need to pay more attention to it, but that's because we paid more attention to it. And it's more recognizing if it's not, if it doesn't feel good, if it feels out of alignment with our wisdom, if it feels out of alignment with the world, we don't need to pay attention to it. And we'll know what to do from somewhere else. But this is also the key to creation. Things that do feel good, things that do feel aligned. Things where the, the world is mirroring back to us amazing things. We get to think that more. We get to make that up more. 
Like thought is powerful. It becomes a reality, not in a control type way, but in more of a indirect relational kind of way. But first people need to realize that they're making it up and then that eventually becomes really good news. First, it helps them step out of their suffering. Then it's permission to, to create more of what they want to create. It becomes kind of playful when you go back into it again. And, and like you said, that there's, there's all of these layers, there's infinite really layers of going back out, realizing that it's made up and then going back in and playing the game in a, in a new and fresh way, in a more enjoyable way. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the fun part. That's, that's the exploration here that we invite our clients to do and we invite you to do like being human is such a trip <laughs> <laughs> it, it's wild <laughs> i just i just think that that we just have this zest for it like like soul like uh, uh who we really are has this zest for like I'm going to forget all about it. And I'm going to go in and have this crazy experience. It's going to be so amazing. Yeah. And when first pointing in this direction, most people will interpret it as don't think, don't become human, just become the monk meditating on a mountain, mm -hmm. completely disconnected one with the universe, but it's kind of gone. And getting a taste for that is helpful. Cause it's like, that's, that's halfway there. Like re realizing that you're not your thinking is halfway there. There is, ooh, yeah, like I, I'm totally in this amazing co-created, uh, like wisdom guided, thought confused, blissful adventure of life. I, I get to be completely human, including totally falling for the trick over and over again. And sometimes making up the trick and then falling for the trick that I made up. <laughs> the, oh man. Uh, <laughs> this reminds me of life. There, there was this comedian that I was watching. He's like, fool me once. Shame on me. Or uh, shame on you, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. Fool me three times. Shame back on you. You should, you know that I'm a, a person that's easily fooled and this is what life does. And then it's like, fool me three times, four times. Shame back on me. I should be picking up at some point when, when all of this is happening. Fool me five times, you've fallen into my trap. <laughs> I <laughs> Fool me six times, you didn't fall for my trap, you saw through it. I've been fooled by the best. And it's, I, I think that's just this relationship that we have with life. <laughs> I love that. That's a very zen. <laughs> it's, it's shame all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hmm. well, uh, Michael, I'd love, I'd love to let, let you have maybe some final comments and then we'll share some of the upcoming cool things. Also, it's an opportunity to, for you to share some of the cool things you're doing. If you have mm -hmm. some offerings or a way that people can find you. Okay. Let's see if there's any final words. Cause I, the last ones I liked. Yeah. So, okay, two things to try at home, even though they sound very bypassy, but oh well. <laughs> per permission to try things that are bypassy to see if it actually helps or not. Because what if? 
One is play with stop it. Like, what if that's actually an option? What if sometimes that's a really, really helpful and healthy and healing and amazing and like consciousness raising thing to do to just stop it? The other is every once in a while, especially if you're having a deep, like powerful experience, especially if it's like something's really wrong, look around your environment and just notice it's just person in room thinking. And that's the only thing that's happening. Like that's a reality check. So try those at home. And stuff that I'm up to. I do approximately once a month, I do insight salons. So online classes where I get to download ideas, talk about some things like this conversation. And I'm a one-on-one -on -one coach primarily. So I offer transformational coaching to executives, entrepreneurs, I mentor other coaches, leaders, people who are up to amazing things who are interested in working from this level and then creating amazing things in the world from a higher understanding. You can, my website is authenticintegrity.com and you can email me at michael at authenticintegrity.com. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today and giving of your time, your presence and your wisdom. And I appreciate all these times with you, Rich. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. If you loved this one too, we, we recorded two podcast episodes. They're awesome. Check those out. And then next week I'm putting in the chat, we're going to have a, an event. Uh, very similar to this one. This one's going to be called spiritual relapse. Where to go when you get low. So I'm going to be talking about what happens, like where I am right now, where I'm in my, this low place and how you can flow in the low, how you can ex still experience what you're experiencing, let it be okay. And I think we can get scared that we've seen maybe these truths and then we, we lost them. And we, our, our mind can create a story about how we've lost all of these stories and, 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 oh man, I've lost my spiritual essence. And it's just fear. So we'll, we'll be continuing that conversation. It's going to be a lot more of the back and forth comments and it's just going to be me. So join the party. Awesome. And I think the week after that, I have someone else as well. Who's after that? Jane Gray. That one wow. is Be Real Not Perfect. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for joining today. You're giving us the greatest gift that you can give, which is your time and attention as well. So we appreciate you. You're welcome thank you to both. unmute and say goodbye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you all so much. Really Thank appreciate you, everyone. It. Yeah. Good Thank to see you, you all. Nice to be the only female here. <laughs> <laughs> I hope more women can come. I was inviting some of my friends. That's unusual. Yeah. Behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> we could all use this advice from Michael. So mm -hmm. good job. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye, people. Bye. Bye.